Trump had started saying some nice things about him when he got into the race. Marina's campaign immediately turned that smartly into an ad that led with Trump's words at a rally somewhere last year saying, you know, we love Ohio and we love Bernie Marino. That ad got played so much last fall before Trump actually did endorse Marino that my six-year-old daughter was quoting it around the house. Oh, That's no. how often it was on TV. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and this week we are taking you to Ohio. And since I went to college there, I'm going to educate you on the state that educated me. (laughs) Thank you for my producer for that. Uh, I went to Kenyon. If you listen to this podcast and you haven't heard me say I went to Kenyon, I did. Some people think Ohio has gotten red enough that it's pretty much fool's gold for Democrats, but incumbent Democratic Senator Sherrod Brown is running for re-election, and it's going to be one of the biggest Senate races in the country in November. So we're going to size up the Republicans vying to run against him, and the primary is on March 19th, just a few days after this episode drops. There's a car salesman endorsed by Trump. There's a normie Secretary of State that's trying the MAGA hat on for size. And a wealthy state senator who somehow still has a shot. And the voters have very loose opinions about all of them. My guest today is Henry Gomez, Ohio-based senior political reporter at NBC News, who can help us make sense of what is going on in Ohio. Henry, thanks for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. So how does this primary compare to the one in 2022? Because we followed that one very closely and just my overall impression. And that was like the JD Vance, uh, Josh Mandel race. And, and, right. and uh, one of the guys who did some of these other guys who are running again, we're all in that race too. That one just seemed to have more flair in it than this one. This one seems a little sleepier. What's going on. Yeah, no, I totally would agree with that assessment. 2022, we had like a, a bounty of riches when it came to just how ugly and nasty and, um, messy that primary was. There were more candidates in that in that race, which I think contributed to it. You also had some pretty strong personalities like J.D. Vance, like Josh Mandel, a guy named Mike Gibbons, who was a, a wealthy businessman who nearly got into a fist fight with Josh Mandel on one of the debate stages. I forgot about Mike Gibbons. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, and settled a lot of voters in that primary at the end of the day. <laughs> but um, this year, you're right. It has been a little sleepier, at least up until the last week or so when we started to see a whole lot more money get poured into the airwaves and we've seen the attacks escalate because what's what's happening is we're seeing the trump candidate bernie marino um face a very robust challenge from the more i guess the comparatively moderate matt dolan i mean matt dolan is running as a conservative but he's more cut from the old guard establishment cloth than bernie marino is and you know, the polls that we are seeing show it's really close between those two. And you're seeing that reflected in some of the endorsements that Dolan has picked up from Governor Mike DeWine and former Senator Rob Portman. And the fact that Trump, who hadn't been planning to come to Ohio at all before the primary, according to my sources, planning a last minute rally for Bernie Marino um, three days before the primary, which is viewed by just about everybody here in Ohio as, you know, the last minute push to get Marino across the finish line. Uh, yeah, you know, I should note that Mike Gibbons, I forgot about this. He's a Kenyan alum. He's a Kenyan alum. That's How did right, I forget about this guy? Uh, le- one of our less auspicious alumni, I guess. Uh, so I, one of the reasons, so there's two reasons I really wanted to do, uh, this podcast right now. One is obviously the, the primary is coming up, although I think it's made very little national news. Like People are not tuned into this the way they were again in 2022. Um, but it is going to determine who's going to run against Sherrod Brown, and that seat is going to be uh, a huge deal. But the other reason that I wanted to do this is the fact that Dolan is like showing something here. And um, Dolan is my type of guy. Uh, my type of Republican, he did, he overperformed in 2022 um, a little bit. Uh, He came in third, but like just behind Josh Mandel and I think did better than any of us had anticipated. Um, So uh, we'll get to more of him in the program, but I I think um, I'm interested to see, it would be, it would be incredible, an incredible upset if Dolan were to pull this out. And so I wanted to take um, a bigger look at it, but 
Before we get into the state races, uh, just because it's been in the news, we did ask this focus group of Ohio two-time Trump voters for the reaction to Joe Biden's State of the Union. The reactions to Biden were like completely predictable from two-time Trump voters. He sounds like he has, you know, dementia or you know, he doesn't sound like he can get a word out, whatever. Uh, but I was struck by how they talked about Katie Britt, the senator from Alabama who gave the Republican response. Let's listen. I thought it was embarrassing. I really did. They just keep throwing people in there and they are saying really dumb things. And, you know, this is going to be funny, but I have been watching The View because you talk about completely opposite um, point of view on that show. You will get it. But I have to watch it because I want to know what the other side's thinking. But they showed quite a bit of her this morning. Like I said, I think it was embarrassing for the Republicans. I really do. They could have done anything to and prove how she appeared, in my opinion. Okay. I really don't even know what she was trying to get across, really. <laughs> I was very confused. Like, I get embarrassed watching it. Like, I have to watch, yeah. stop watching this train wreck or car accident happening in front of me because there's, like, nothing I can do about it. And it's like, why? Like, why? So I bring up Katie Britt, not just to pile on with the two-time Trump voters, uh, but because... I have long been saying that I thought she was a real uh, potential vice presidential candidate. Um, And so before we get into the other things, I do want to ask you about J.D. Vance, because Mm -hmm. as 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 sort of Nancy Mace and Carrie Lake and, you know, like we've all had the sense that Trump's going to go with a woman. But as we watch. Many of these women sort of debase themselves to get the VP nod. They are blowing up their own chances at being taken seriously. Uh, and it's starting to feel more like J.D. Vance could really be the guy. What's your sense of J.D. Vance's likelihood that he could be the VP pick? Well, I, would, I would think he's a long shot just based on the fact that he's not been in the Senate very long. And, you know, there's just going to be this pressure on Trump to pick, you know, a woman or perhaps a, a candidate of color. But one thing that struck me in, in that, I think it was in that particular focus group, Sarah, was when they were, when they were asked about G.D. Vance, they had very strong and positive opinions of him, which is is rare for a sen- like senators in Ohio, and I assume this is true in other states as well, aren't as well known or as well loved as governors. Like governors are the ones that get the headlines and are more out there on the local news or on the front page of the local paper as opposed to the senators that are mostly end up becoming creatures of Washington. But Vance, who's, you know what, in his second year in the Senate, to have these like very strong and positive opinions in his favor, that that really struck me. And and to tie it back to the Brit uh, conversation, it it strikes me that Ohio voters, or at least many of them have a good uh, BS detector or can sense authenticity and they see it in Vance, but maybe didn't see it in Katie Britt's State of the Union response. The thing I'll say about Vance is something that one of the voters in that group brought up, and it's that he became very visible after the train wreck in East Palestine, the chemical uh, disaster there, and really put himself into the into the spotlight there. But in a way that was trying to like you know start a constructive conversation about it. Yeah, he was throwing some partisan bombs at Biden for not being there earlier or at Buttigieg for not coming soon enough. But he he did really take that on as a as a leadership issue. And I think it put pressure on on the Democrats to respond more to that tragedy. And it's become kind of his signature issue here in Ohio. And we also see headlines of him you know, teaming up with senators like Democrats, like Elizabeth Warren on legislation. And I do think that People like seeing that. They like seeing some results and they like seeing that maybe he didn't go to Washington and become exactly the ideologue he came across as on the campaign trail. So I, I think for all those reasons, he would make a strong contender, um, strong entry on Trump's shortlist. I just don't know how feasible or, or likely it would be. Well, you referenced the fact that these voters uh, were said positive things about him. And I want to play some of that sound because it is having listened to voters and even the voters, when they talk about people they're going to vote for, they rarely talk about them, you know, that enthusiastically. But they were nice about Vance. Let's listen. I don't know that I can say every decision he's ever made on anything, but I think for the most part, I have been pretty aligned. And, you know, like I said before, I don't think there's a lot of transparency on either side, but. I think there has been 
at least the ability to kind of figure out why he voted a certain way or what decisions were made. After the train wreck um, in Ohio, uh, he actually came to one of the creeks where they were doing the soil sampling and everything. And he was one of the first people from the government to actually go and do that and make a comment as opposed to it took Biden a really long time. It took other people. So I kind of just said that he had like the forefront to get out there in front of something, kind of tackle it. I liked that about him, the initiative. Yeah, you know. Vance is a weird one for me because uh, the never Trump J.D. Vance is the one that I liked. Um, And so watching him go through the metamorphosis where he became fiery populist J.D. Vance uh, came across to me as deeply inauthentic and craven. Uh, But it is interesting that you know, voters will give you sort of one road to Damascus moment, you know, if you switch on, because a lot of them did. I mean, I remember when Ohio went for Kasich in 2016, and they thought, you know, that Trump was bad. And obviously, now Ohio has um, undergone some, it's not even uh, ideological shifts exactly, but it has become very Trumpy. Um, And so, and to the point where I got to say, populist J.D. Vance I know what you're saying about him being newish in the Senate. He does seem like he's starting to feel like the heir apparent a little bit to the populist side of what yep. Trump does. And and it seems to fit Ohio particularly well, as well as some of these Midwestern states that went for Trump in 16 and really have changed the dynamic in our politics. Do, do you agree with that or tell me what you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, you know, we, we can all talk about the the hillbilly elegy days where jd vance was on a, a book tour and talking a lot of trash about donald trump and how he wasn't going to vote for him and that's what a lot of people remembered about him who were following politics closely at the time and it was a little bit jarring to see the switch but i do think that the you know he comes at his populism from a very intellectual point of view um and sometimes that might fly over voters heads but he, he is fairly consistent on it and um You know, Sherrod Brown, who, you know, is the other senator in Ohio, has populist credentials as well. And they so they both are kind of in tune with that working class aesthetic, although they come at it, obviously, from different ideologies. But, you know, it's 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 something that I think that because Vance has put the work behind it in the Senate and the stuff that he's received coverage for doing since he's been there, um, whether it's the East Palestine train disaster, whether it's, um, you know, consumer uh, affairs issues that he's sort of taken the lead on. It's, it's stuff that people like and respond to in a way that they don't um, necessarily when it comes to, you know, much more, I don't know, at an issue in Congress. But um, and to another point, I tell this to everybody in Ohio, no one is pure on Trump. So like J.D. Vance did get wrapped for that pretty heavily in his primary. Bernie Marino uh, has come in for his criticism as well because he was a critic of Trump in 2016. But yes, this was a case state in 2016. So nearly everybody supported somebody else for president that year. And it's how you make that pivot, I think, at least it'll determine how far you go with Trump voters. They will sort of give you that mulligan, but you have to be able to explain it in a way that makes sense to them, uh, which in the case of both J.D. Vance and Bernie Marino is really, 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 really kiss up to Trump, say how wrong you were, how right he was, uh, and that you have never been so happy to be proven wrong about something. But they do it, and they've they've done it in a way that's convincing, I suppose, to to voters, and so that's kept them out of trouble uh, with them. Well, we can't we can't say that for Bree Marino quite yet. Yeah, I mean J D Vance. If it's a bit, he's extremely committed to it, and I I actually think J D Vance has found, like you said, I think he he he's an intellectual guy. He's like a pretty serious guy, and so I think he found a story to tell himself that allowed him to sort of be this person that he he now has internalized and believes. I like get the sense when I hear J.D. Vance, as much as he drives me crazy on X and Twitter, that like he's not just playing anymore. There's like enough in here that he thinks he's on the right side. Um, and so he he and and look, he shows good political instincts on things like this. I mean, it was I Buttigieg or Biden, you know, you have those kinds of of accidents like yeah, that's what politicians do. They get there, they show up, they make people feel uh, like they care about it. And it, that's something that he did and uh, did to take too long. And that clearly, it was in the group. You could just tell that made a big yeah. impression on people. All right, let's get into the current Senate race, starting with the guy that Vance has endorsed. Uh, Bernie Moreno is a Cleveland area car salesman 
who's running for the second time. He dropped out of the race in 2022 to clear the way for J.D. Vance. The voters we talked to didn't have that many impressions of him as a candidate, but they knew Moreno's one big value proposition for his candidacy. Let's listen. That is the beat of every one of his ads. Trump endorsed that so far, that is his only qualification and the fact that he is not a lifelong politician. I actually was looking into it before we did this. I know one of them, Trump wants Bernie and then the Marino guy. That was the guy that kind of like just kind of jumped out to me. The first guy, Frank, I was like, man, but I will have to go in and do more research. I think that. You know, I'm going to go with whoever Trump endorses because, you know, I'm looking at the team working well together. (laughs) So that will probably win it for me. I live in Cleveland and I had never heard his name before you asked me about it on the screening call like two hours ago. I have no idea who he is. (laughs) I don't know anything about him. Yeah, I see him as similar to Donald Trump in the way that he's an outsider and not part of the political machine, which makes me think that maybe he's not corrupted by whatever corrupts the politics. Well, it's money, you know, but he's coming into it already with his own money. And I don't think Trump even knew what he was doing anyway. He just throws it out there. I'm sure he didn't go to Bernie's website and check him out. He probably just knew he was a millionaire. Oh, you're a millionaire. You got my vote. I'll endorse you. That's how I feel about it. That last person liked liked Donald Trump just fine, though, <laughs> despite that she was uh, sort of joking about how he made his decision. So it was a, it was different in both the groups, right? One group was just a little more tapped in, like they they were paying more attention. And in that group, Moreno was cleaning up. Uh, in the other group, where people seem to be paying a lot less attention, uh, like you heard that woman say she hadn't heard of him. And so, how much does a Trump endorsement, because you broke the news, right, that that Trump was going to be headlining the rally for Moreno on Saturday, March 16th, which is, I believe, the day that this podcast comes out. So um, what do you like? How important is it that Trump is is endorsing Moreno? Well, if he hadn't, I mean, Moreno would probably not have a prayer in this race because he was polling in single digits at the beginning and this was after having briefly been a candidate in the 2022 primary. And then Trump had started saying some nice things about him when he got into the race this time. Marina's campaign immediately turned that smartly into an ad that led with Trump's words at a rally somewhere last year saying, you know, we love Ohio and we love Bernie Marino. That ad got played so much last fall before Trump actually did endorse Marino that my six-year-old daughter was quoting it around the house. Oh, no. That's how often it was on TV. (laughs) And so they were using that to drive up Bernie's poll numbers to get him into a spot where they could show Trump and say, hey, look, he's rising. Now's the time to get on board. So in December, Trump endorses Marino, and we've seen the numbers go up. The problem is it, it hasn't sealed the deal for him. There's still lot of undecided voters here. And Matt Dolan has spent so much money on television, you know, hammering his own message that it created this close race. And then you have Frank LaRose, we haven't really talked about yet, but as a two-term secretary of state. And in one of those uh, focus groups, I believe it was the one where the voters were slightly less um, plugged in to the race. I mean, Frank LaRose cleaned up with them because I'm guessing he has the name. He has the name recognition. You know, they right. they know that they've seen him on the ballot before and what they have read about him they like. But if they haven't been following this race closely, they haven't seen, and you mentioned this at the outset, Sarah, that, that LaRose has really gone on this full MAGA conversion away from the more centrist, no labels, normy, moderate Republican that he had been in the past. So I'm sorry, this is a long answer to your question. I do think the yeah. Trump endorsement has obviously helped Bernie Marino, it just hasn't sealed the deal for him. And the fact that we're, you know, a few days out from this primary and he has to call Trump in for a last minute rally, the fact that, you know, we're seeing polls showing Marino and Dolan neck and neck. It, it's, um, well, we heard this from the voters in those focus groups. They, what they know about Bernie is that Trump endorsed him. And that isn't necessarily going to mean that they vote for Bernie 
Marino. And he hasn't maybe defined himself beyond just being the guy that Trump endorsed. Whereas they, they've seen enough about Matt Dolan and his TV ads, and they've seen or heard enough about Frank LaRose over the years, where they, they feel they know those two candidates a little bit better. So the Trump thing isn't enough, I guess, is what we're seeing. Yeah. I mean, what I remember about Trump's endorsement of J.D. Vance was how much that helped J.D. Vance. Like, J.D. Vance was really sort of sucking wind behind Josh Mandel. uh, And Trump got in there, endorsed Vance, and that, like, made the difference. It shot him up uh, like a rocket. Um, And Trump loves uh, taking somebody who's been not so nice to him and turning them into a convert and showing that he can come to their rescue. Um, But, you know, I wonder if... For Frank LaRose, who you were just talking about, which I think uh, you just made a great point about him, is it that he, as he's gotten more mad, because like, look, I, I'm not a, I'm very mad at no labels right now for thinking about third party candidates, but generally I'm sort of a moderate squish in that way and love me some secretaries of state, especially Republican secretaries of state who certified the 2020 election and did the right thing. Frank LaRose was that guy. But yeah, he's gone through this MAGA conversion. And so is he, and we're going to get into the sound about him, but do you think he's splitting the MAGA vote with Moreno? And that's why it's like he's getting the the uh, low info MAGA people and Moreno's getting the high info MAGA people and Dolan's over there with his Nikki Haley consolidation. Yeah, I think there's some, I think there's definitely something to that. LaRose has been able to cut into the the Trump supporting base that has limited what Bernie's been able to do in the polls. I think that LaRose also does really well in the rural areas where the information might not be flowing quite as much. And what what the Marino campaign is trying to do, I think in this last week or two here, or what they've been trying to do is through their own advertising and through LaRose's campaign sort of going in the opposite direction. They are doing what they can to try to pick up those voters. They've been advertising more in like smaller markets, um, including like places like Charleston, West Virginia, which reaches in to, to Southeastern Ohio or Fort Wayne, Indiana, which reaches in to Western Ohio to try to like pick up some of those, you know, lower information voters who may have been with LaRose because of name ID, but who would be beneficial to Bernie to pull ahead of Dolan. So yeah, I think there's definitely something to that. And the problem is, is, is Dolan spent so much money and he, you know, he cleaned up in Cleveland and Columbus last time, which, you know, they're democratic areas, but they're also two of the biggest, you know, um, voting populations, even for Republicans in a Republican primary. So if Dolan holds his own there and then starts doing well in the suburbs, um, that just me- that just makes more vote that, that Marino has to peel away from, from LaRose and some of these uh, rural areas. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's talk about uh, LaRose or let's listen to what the voters had to say. Um, you know, just this guy, I, he makes me so sad. I mean, he in 2020, he said that, you know, calling the election results uh, false was irresponsible uh, or saying that the election was stolen was irresponsible. Then when he was running for reelection in 2022, he said, President Trump is right to say voter fraud is a serious problem. So let's listen to how voters thought about him. LaRose has actually, I think, been very effective as Secretary of State. I think he has done a very good job at strengthening it. I've worked the last couple of elections uh, in the polls, and I'm somewhat amazed about the security that's been put into it in Ohio, where I think it is the double and triple checks on things, you know, protecting it in terms of the voter IDs and things like this. He does have a really good website. I've been on it before, and I think it's kind of helped with some of the questions, things that I've had. So if you're maybe on the fence, that might be something you want to look at because it might help you one way or another. From what I know about him is that he was a Cub Scout and then he was actually an Army Green Beret, I think. And I mean, he's not my first choice, but I don't really like the other two choices too much. So he's my middle ground. Um, It says that he does work hard and that he, you know, along the line has had some integrity, whether or not you know, I think everybody's a puppet for somebody else. And I hate to say it like that, but he's one that I could see myself voting for and not beat myself up too much about it. You know, there were multiple people who named she said Cub Scouts, but I think she meant Eagle Scout because I heard other people mention Eagle Scout. How Mm -hmm. is the Scouts very important in Ohio? People seem to really gravitate to that particular factoid with a candidate. 
That surprised me too when I heard when I heard that comment. Um, and it's something that I know that Morose's campaign has pushed out there in its messaging. The fact that he's an evil scout and a green beret, so maybe it's just um, an example of the one thing that is getting through to voters about Frank Morose is that, which I'm sure his his campaign folks would take that any day of the week because those are not bad, you know, things to be identified with. The other thing somebody said, I'm not sure if it was just in the clip, but like one one woman mentioned how he was the only candidate on the race with young children. And that that was a um, that was something that distinguished him in a good way, which was interesting. I never thought about that. I mean, LaRose hasn't run a very um, super open like parents' rights campaign like we've seen in other states, but it made me think maybe there was like a lane for him there that he could have ridden a little harder and maybe appealed to some people given that he has a, a young family. So yeah, I mean, the, the fact that those things stand out to voters, that's good for LaRose. He just hasn't had a whole lot of money or a super PAC hasn't had enough money to put let me put it this way. The LaRose Super PAC in the last few weeks has been running a lot of negative ads on the other candidates. LaRose has not had any money in his own campaign to run ads at all. So there's been no positive on TV about Frank LaRose. It's all been negative about the other candidates. And when we're seeing his uh, base of support erode in these polls, that just, help, that, that just helps like Matt, <laughs> Matt Dolan or Bernie Marino, really. Um, and, if, and if Frank LaRose's Super PAC is bashing Bernie Marino, then that helps Matt Dolan. Uh, and it doesn't help Frank Lorenz. Can I ask about sort of what I see as the cynical shift on the voting, you know, the election being stolen? I, yeah. I, I, what do you make of the transformation? Was it all in preparation for this run here? Um, or like, why? Have you, did you see that evolve in him? With, with Lorenz particular? Yeah. 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 So I covered Frank Lorenz for a long time. I mean, I was out in New Hampshire covering Kasich's campaign where Frank Lorenz was John Kasich's advance man in New Hampshire, setting up the events for him. You know, he was Kasich till I die, basically. Um, and even made comments, you know, in the fall of 2016 about how he couldn't in good conscience support Trump. I think this was around the time of Nexus Hollywood. So, I mean, more broadly, the transformation has been very jarring to watch because LaRose had always, you know, identified as Mr. No Labels. <laughs> and as far as the election stuff goes, yeah, it did take more of a turn after 2020. You know, he, you know, fortunately for him, the result in Ohio was so decisive, Trump won by eight points, that there was no need for a Republican looking to impress Trump to go inventing fraud where it didn't exist. And so LaRose didn't have to do that. He could just say, we run elections great here in Ohio, and I'm the reason why. And that was, you know, also a good, you know, and an accurate talking point, I suppose. But it was 2022 where we really saw the shift and it actually has to do with J.D. Vance. Um, J.D. Vance was looking for endorsements for a Senate campaign and there were other statewide candidates looking for Donald Trump support. So on the day that Frank LaRose endorsed J.D. Vance for Senate, which was the day that Donald Trump was coming to Ohio to rally for J.D. Vance, Donald Trump endorsed Frank LaRose's re-election campaign for Secretary of State. And that's when we started hearing Lorenz talked more about election fraud and creating an election integrity unit in the Secretary of State's office. He still, to be fair, emphasizes that, you know, there isn't, you know, widespread fraud, at least in Ohio. And if you push him really hard and don't let go, he will acknowledge that he does not believe the 2020 election at large was stolen from Trump. But he started to weave in more of these talking points that we hear other candidates who want to have it both ways, where he talks about Zuckerbox and, you know, the influence of the media, you know, being the elements that rigged or, or, or shaped the election, which is a lot different than saying, you know, a bunch of votes were altered or stolen or miscast and that that somehow altered the, the course of the election, which we know isn't true. There's one more key player in this race. Back in 2022, you may remember that State Senator Matt Dolan finished in a strong third place despite affirming that Joe Biden won in 2020. There was one Matt Dolan voter between the two focus groups we did, but based on what we heard from all the other participants, he wasn't winning any converts. So let's listen to how they talked about Dolan, starting with one guy talking about why Dolan didn't get Trump's endorsement. Something about when he endorsed changing the name of the Cleveland Indians to the Cleveland Guardians. He's not going to endorse anybody who <laughs> supports making that decision. I mean, he seems like a nice guy, just what little I've looked at, but he seems like he would be wishy-washy. I don't know. That's just my first impression. Like, I haven't done a lot of research. I think it's um, Matt Dolan owns part of the 
the one that just got the name changed, the Guardians. He seems to be the only non-Trump apologist in the race. Whereas Frank LaRose, I like him. I've met him before. Um, he's an Eagle Scout that, I mean, like, good guy. But it seems like he's just been over backwards for Trump the past couple of years. So I want no part of that. So Matt Dolan seems to be an independent thinker. Um, he's a businessman as well. And he's a state senator and pretty good one from what I understand. So that's why I would, I'm would i planning to vote for him. So for context, Dolan is the son of the Cleveland Guardians, formerly Cleveland Indians, owner Larry Dolan. Uh, Now, that sound is very interesting because despite the lukewarm reception that Dolan got from the focus group, a new Emerson College poll has him leading. Uh, He's polling 26 percent, Moreno's at 23 percent, and LaRose is at 16 percent with 32 percent undecided. And if there was anything to really take away from the focus groups, it was that, like, there's some real undecided voters out there. They are still just starting to get their heads around this race. So when Emerson did that same poll back in January, Moreno was at 22 percent, LaRose was at 21 percent, and Dolan was at 15 percent. So something's going on. And I think we heard two things that might explain Dolan's polling bump. So he's consolidating the Nikki Haley type voters uh, who may vote in in his primary, who, by the way, tend to be very reliable primary voters. Uh, And the Cleveland Guardians controversy notwithstanding, he's been on the air. You said this, right? He has been on the air the most, the absolute most so far. And that matters a great deal when people, you know, this need to do more research uh, into all the candidates means that there's just a lot of undecided voters out there. So. You've talked about how he overperformed in 2022 because he spent a lot of his own money uh, and no opponents took him seriously. But as you've recently tweeted about, Club for Growth is spending against him. So what's their line of attack? Is it the Guardian's name thing? Uh, Like, is that something that you expect will hurt him with the locals? It came up several times. People seem to know about it. And what do you think explains the Emerson College poll that is Dolan leading? Take the second one first. I think the the lead is... What reflects that is that how much money he's spending again on the airwaves. He's had a lot of ads. A lot of them are policy oriented, and he talks a lot in interviews and debates about how he is for Trump policies, you know, which is his way of getting around. He's not a huge Trump guy otherwise. But like his ads are very policy driven. He talks a lot about the border and the fentanyl crisis. I think those are issues that resonate with Ohioans that they can look at. And, you know, he, you know, he might come off as a generic Republican, but he's got a name that they might remember. And maybe it's because they associate it with the baseball team. I don't know. But he's he's putting a lot of money behind himself. And it's not all negative ads about somebody else. There's a lot of positive building up his own case. So I think that's what's getting through. I think um, when you were asking about oh, the club for growth, you know, they it was weird. One of their first ads on him was hitting him on a gas tax that he supported in the legislature, which almost every other Republican supported at the time as well and it seemed to maybe be more of like a placeholder ad the club was like you know sending the warning shot that they were about to start going hard on dolan and since then they've come at him with much more aggressive like this is the anti-trump guy in the race which is you know kind of hilarious because club for growth was just last year plotting an anti-trump uh messaging campaign of its own and now it's kind of in league with trump uh in the ohio senate race they they back bernie marino and their ads are targeting dolan so I think that um, what we're going to hear a lot of in the last few days on the airwaves, is, you know, Matt Dolan is not for Trump. He's anti-Trump. We're going to probably hear more of the Cleveland Guardians name change stuff, which which dogged him a little bit at the end of the last race as well. To the extent that like Moreno and Trump and their allies can boil Matt, can make Matt Dolan look like this, you know, woke rhino um, anti-Trump guy that'll be to their benefit because as we saw in this focus groups that they, they do remember the, the Cleveland guardians thing, which is surprising to me because Matt Dolan is not like, an you know, he's worked, you know, he's, he's had a role in managing the ball club, not a very big one, but like he, he's not an out front, like leader of the organization, but they do associate that with him and not in the, and not in a positive way. So like, and those are things that they can understand, right? They can't really like ask them to understand the gas tax and all the nuances of it. That's one thing, but say he, you know, he caved to the woke mob and changed the name of the Cleveland, your beloved Cleveland Indians. And that's something that that people can understand. Yeah. I mean, when you, uh, we're not going to play all of the sound, but there was plenty of sound of people expressing their frustration with that name change. Like it went deep with them in terms of their own, uh, being annoyed about it. Um, 
So Dolan has also been endorsed by Senator Rob Portman, retiring, uh, and Governor Mike DeWine. The problem is that those two guys are both relics of the pre-Trump Republican Party that uh, voters I listen to all the time don't seem that enamored with anymore. Um, so while there are some sort of DeWine Portman types out there, we didn't find them in this in any of these groups that we did of the two time Trump voters. So I wanted to play some of the sound about how they talked about Governor DeWine. I used to love him. Not anymore. He crossed over. I don't know what happened to him. Transgender ideology, I guess, is what I want to say. I don't have any idea what in the world coerced him or convinced him to say that all this was okay. Yeah. I don't know where it came from. I think it came out of COVID. These kids get on there and they make stuff up and then everybody says, yeah, that's a great idea. You're right. I do think I'm a boy. Oh, well, let's just go ahead and have surgery or take some puberty blockers. And I mean, it's no matter what you think, it's insanity. I just had the feeling that like many other politicians, he was afraid of being labeled a transphobic and unfortunately fear of being labeled like that sways a lot of politicians mm -hmm. into doing things that maybe they really wouldn't do otherwise. I think he used to be much more conservative and I think he has caved whether he's doing it only outwardly you know, and for show, and it really is against his personal convictions or whether he's changed his convictions, I can't say one way or another, but he is not nearly as conservative mm -hmm. as he used to be. Not a lot of love for Mike DeWine for our group. Now, this guy is a second term governor. And uh, but what Ted, well, just you tell me what's going on here. So the and a couple of them mentioned it, it, it goes back to COVID and the early days of the pandemic, you know, Mike DeWine was one of the first governors in the country of either party, but in one of the few Republicans who led with science, at least at the beginning. He was very early to to close things down. I mean, he had daily, um, like, you know, everybody talks about Cuomo's broadcasts in New York. Um, DeWine did them in Ohio, and they were appointment viewing for everybody. Like, you know, and it became very big with suburban moms. They called it wine with DeWine. They would they would have their glass of wine while they watched him and his health director do the updates. But this slowly began to infuriate the right because he was early on locking things down. He supported a mask mandate for a while. He eventually rolled all of these things back earlier than many people thought he should have if he was following the science. But it didn't matter. It really, really hurt him with the far right base of the party. The flip of that is, when he was up for re-election in 2022, he won his primary. We had two challengers from the right, I think, with 50%, or right around 50% of the vote. He was re-elected in the general election by a landslide. And so the calculus here, if you're Matt Dolan, I don't think the Dolan campaign, like, Mike DeWine is, is a, you know, not a young man. He's term limited. He's not going to run for anything again. So it's a part of the one voter in that panel. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what he's labeled. Like he's, he's governor. He's at that stage in his career where he's doing what he thinks is right. And he didn't, he wouldn't have come out and endorsed Matt Dolan publicly if he thought it would hurt him or if the Dolan campaign said, Hey, look, thanks, but no, thanks. You could do us more harm. This is obviously being calculated in a way that they feel could help Matt Dolan. And I think where it could help Matt Dolan is those suburban moms that I just told you about. There are a lot of independent leaning voters in Ohio who still like Mike DeWine. And there are a lot of Republicans who still like Mike DeWine and do wish that the party would, you know, revert more to that form of Republicanism. So if, you know, if Matt Dolan's doing well in the big cities, like I mentioned, and Frank LaRose is doing pretty well in rural, um, that makes the suburbs a much bigger battleground between Marino and Dolan. And that's where Mike DeWine can, can be a difference, I think. So I must have missed, I know that there was a big ballot initiative on abortion in Ohio recently, but what's the trans stuff? Why? What What was that about? So there was something came up um, a few months ago where um, DeWine was, and I, I don't know all the intricacies of it, but basically DeWine was supportive of something that didn't go as far as the right wanted him to. He was a little more sympathetic to the rights of parents when it came to, you know, having these conversations with their children about, you know, um, 
about care, about their healthcare decisions, and it got vetoed. It got vetoed. It, he, he he vetoed a bill from the legislature because he thought it went too far. The legislature, over, which is you know heavily Republican, over overrid his veto. But then you know Dwight also did some things by executive order that the that you know Democrats and people that are more progressive on this issue didn't like. So, but the headline was he didn't do what the far right wanted to on this issue, and so he was seen as being you know overly sympathetic to the. To, to, to transgender people or, you know, and it's, it's really one of those arguments over like, Dwayne was trying to be consistent, right? He's like, you know, if, if we're for parents' rights, then we should also be for allowing parents to make this decision with their children who are going through this, if, you know, who, who are contemplating, you know, this, this life-changing decision. Um, and we should not be uh, saying no under no circumstances under the law are you allowed to do this. So that's basically what it was. It was it was it was upsetting to, to people on the right who were very have very strong feelings about this issue. Um, but anybody that knows Mike DeWine, you know, wasn't really surprised by it. So leaving DeWine aside for a second, I remember and I cannot remember her name. I should have Googled it while you were talking, but I was listening to you. Um, the woman who ran in the twenty twenty two primary. Uh, Man Whaley. Oh. No, no, no. Um, the pipe. Yeah, she was the RNC, the head of the RNC. Oh, Jane Timken. Jane, Jane Timken. Timken, thank you. Um, so Timken also, uh, she like led her campaign. I remember her first ad was about men playing women's sports. Is this a big, is there a scourge of men playing women's sports uh, in Ohio? Like, why is this, is, is this, is this a huge problem in Ohio? Like, tell me what's going on. It's not. It's not a huge problem in Michigan where we saw Tudor Dixon kind of run with the same type of rhetoric in, in her governor's race in 2022. But it's, I think what happened was we saw the success that people saw the success Glenn Youngkin had with a campaign that wasn't about necessarily this issue in particular, but was more, you know, parents' rights has become this umbrella. And it's something that does appeal very much to, um, you know, right-leaning voters in Ohio. And they feel that they should have a say in, in everything. <laughs> um, even if it's something that you sort of I don't want to be like Terry McCall and say you like gave up that right or relinquished that right. That, that did hit in in that governor's race, but it's it's just something that I think got poll tested. I remember talking to a consultant in Ohio about this in 2022 and asked why are we seeing Jane Timken make such a big issue of this, and he's like, oh, it's the rare, it's the rare like you know 80 20 or 90 10 issue in politics right now because you know even though like the country has come such a far away on you know gay rights and other LGBTQ rights, this is still like something where like people who aren't as informed or haven't, you know, learned enough or thought enough about this issue. There's still a lot of people that have problems with, you know, the sports issue, which to your point is not something that's widespread or prevalent. Well, yeah, it, look, it's, it's something super... that you could get people riled up about if you talk about it. Yeah. I mean, it's a super complicated issue when you like sure. really dig into it, but the, but it's weird, but it's also like a not so prevalent issue uh, that it like, I just find it always a little shocking that people are like, no, this is why I'm voting for this person. And I'm like, does this affect 0.2% of the, po like, well, and, and uh, anyway, I won't get on my whole thing about that. Um, were you surprised on abortion uh, since the, 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 it did overwhelmingly pass in Ohio, the, this, these groups were, uh, they, they said that it was a confusing, but they were, essentially took what I guess I would say the pro-life position. Uh, at least the one full group did. I can't actually remember what the yeah. split was, but what did you make of the abortion views? You know, I, I thought that they pretty much, you know, expressed it. It, it was pretty tribal. Like if you were, if, if the voter in that group was pretty pro-life, I think there was only, I think there was one, there were a couple pro-choice um, voters in those panels that I saw, which was a little surprising, but but their their feelings on the amendment that passed last year were pretty much ran along, like whether they were pro life or pro choice. And it is nuanced, but it's also not. Like the 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 campaign last year was to enshrine abortion rights in the state constitution. There were some questions as to like how far up into how far into a pregnancy would that be allowed. But those were questions that were asked and answered throughout the campaign. Um, so I'm not, and I'm not surprised with how the vote ended up turning out in Ohio. I mean, it's, it's, it was, you know, 57%, I think, in favor of, of, you know, enshrining these rights into the state constitution, which is pretty much in line with where public opinion is in the state. So it's, um, again, it kind of fell along, I think it falls along whether you're, you know, anti-abortion or, you know, 
pro-abortion rights, how you felt about that. Well, with all that being said, here's then the $64,000 question. Can Sherrod Brown, let's say it's Bernie Moreno, let's say it's Matt Dolan. Can Sherrod Brown beat either of them, both of them? What do you think? I think... Neither of them? I think Sherrod Brown could beat any of them. I think it's the hardest re-election campaign he'll ever face. I think he did Democrats a solid by running again. He's not, you know, getting any younger. He's done this now for three terms. You know, he can go and enjoy his his grandkids with, with his wife. But, um, you know, I think part of the reason he ran again is that he knew that no other Democrat in Ohio could win the seat. And I think he's absolutely correct about that. We saw what a, a fairly strong candidate like Tim Ryan was able to do in 2022, and that's lose to J.D. Vance by the same margin that Joe Biden lost to, to Donald Trump in Ohio. So Sherrod can win, but it's going to be really hard because there's going to be so much money and because it's a, it is a Republican state now. I mean, abortion is a single issue, and you'll see the Democrats and Sherrod Brown make as much of that as they can, and I think that they're onto something. All three of the Republican candidates were opposed to that constitutional amendment, um, which means the Democrats will also argue that they're opposed to IVF because that there was uh, there was a provision about that in the constitutional amendment. So mm-hmm. those are going to be positions that could come back and, and haunt them in a general election, and, and you'll you'll definitely hear a lot about that. But I mean, it's a it's a state that's trending away from from Democrats, and you know, Sherrod Brown had a really tough race in 2012 against Josh Mendel. He won. Obama was on the ballot that year. Obama also won Ohio. In 2018, he kind of locked up. Mendel was going to run again, but ended up dropping out at the last minute. And Jim Renese, the Republican candidate, was Republicans even agree on this point was a pretty lousy candidate for Republicans that year. So so Sherrod Brown won again. This year, I mean, Matt Dolan is from Cleveland as well, from the Cleveland area. So he's going to do well in some of those Democratic candidates that, that, that Sherrod Brown needs to have high margins in, relatively well, I should say. Bernie Marino, more of a blank slate. They can, they're already trotting out oppo on him about, you know, lawsuits that he faced as a car salesman and some other things. I, It's going to be really tough for Sherrod Brown. Uh, he can win, but I think all three of those Republicans can beat him as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my read on it, just cursory, would be that Dolan, sort of like Nikki Haley, had they been able to get, can they, if they can get through a primary, uh, they represent just a much smaller slice of the Republican Party than they used to, these kind of normie Republican types. But if they could get through a primary because Moreno and LaRose um, are splitting the MAGA vote, like he's tough to beat in a general election because the suburbs come home and people don't realize this about Ohio. It has like a lot of suburbs uh, because it has a lot of um, sort of smaller urban areas really? like uh, and so that even though it's quite rural and I loved uh, and if I haven't mentioned Kenyon College yet, I'll just do it again. Uh, I'm kidding. I know I've mentioned it. Uh, it it's in like the rolling, beautiful corn uh, growing hills. Uh, but there are uh, lots of urban and suburban areas there where I think Dolan uh, could could do really well. And I think he'd, he'd win by DeWine level margins, potentially. Or do you disagree with that? The only, the only wild card about Dolan is if he's the nominee, you have this situation where Trump and Dolan running on the same ticket who aren't temperamentally similar, who there's some bad blood between now. Like, you know, you know Republicans want to win. They'll it'll be bygones and you know Dolan and Trump will tick it up in at least a way that doesn't cause much disruption. But you can't ever count on there not being disruption when Donald Trump is involved. And is he going to try to undermine Dolan, his candidacy in any way, or try to like pull Dolan further to the right? Is Dolan going to have to make nice with Trump and do some things that undermine his appeal to those middle of the road, you know, suburban voters? I don't know the answer to that. And it's not something we'll know until we see it start playing out if if Dolan is the nominee. But but you know, more um, in the abstract, yes. Matt, Matt Dolan would appeal can appeal to the suburban voters. He can do well in places like Cuyahoga County, um, in the suburbs around there. He could do well in Franklin County in the suburbs around there. Um and by well, that's relatively speaking. Like he can hold Sherrod Brown's margins down in those counties, which is huge. You know, if Sherrod Brown can't get like 72, 75% of the vote in Cuyahoga County, he's not going to be reelected. Hmm. All right. Uh, well, we are going to come back 
and do this all again in Ohio once we have a nominee. Uh, and uh, we'll see if Sherrod Brown can do the impossible, which is help a Democrat win in now a much redder Ohio. Henry, I didn't ask you at the jump. Where did you go to college? Did you go to college in Ohio? I did. I went to Youngstown State University. Youngstown in, State. Yeah. All right. Grew up, in, grew up in Youngstown, still have family there. So Are you buddies with Tim Ryan? He's from Youngstown. We hate we're not buddies, but we've known each other a long time. I, I covered his, for one of my first scoops in this business was his announcement that he was running for gym traffic and seat in Congress. I was working at the Warren Tribune Chronicle, and um, that was his hometown paper, uh, Warren, just north of Youngstown. But um, yes, uh, I love the Mountain Valley, and uh, you know I see a lot of reporters parachute in to Youngstown during election season. I'm lucky that I only have to get in my car and drive home to see mom and dad. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I crashed a car in Youngstown once. That's what I know about Youngstown. Who uh, hasn't? <laughs> I, <laughs> it was, you know, it's a long drive between Pennsylvania and Ohio that I used to make all the time. Uh, and Tim Ryan, incidentally, also a guest on this podcast, which means he has one of these focus group mugs, which we will send you to Henry. Henry Gomez, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to all of you for listening to another episode of the Focus Group podcast. Remember to rate, review and subscribe, and we will see you all next week.